If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 10. I was thinking about how blessed we are to know a God who speaks to us. You know, when we, t- when we say that we hear the voice of God or that God speaks to us, sometimes some of us, a few of us, have maybe heard an audible voice. But that's not really what all we're talking about when we talk about the voice of God. Uh, when Elijah was going through his hard time, you all know the story about Elijah? He, he uh, had a great miracle on Mount Carmel. He called the fire of God down. The, the prophets of Baal were destroyed, and he had a great victory, and he thought, now I'll get King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Now they've got to believe in God because of this great miracle. It's a great miracle, this great victory. And Queen Jezebel ended up telling him, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And he went running. He didn't run because he was afraid. He ran, I believe, because he was just said, what do I got to do to make her believe? And he ended up in a cave. When he was in that cave running from what God had called him to do, God said, God sent an earthquake. He said, Elijah, my voice isn't in the earthquake. And he sent a storm, lightning. He said, my voice isn't in there. Then he sent him a still, small voice. Sometimes God speaks to us through that little voice inside of us. And I know a lot of people have a question, well, how do I know if it's God? Because there's lots of voices. You know, uh, I've had voices. I've heard voices before. (laughs) How can we tell if it's God or not? In chapter 10 of John's Gospel, Jesus is speaking, and he says this. Well, actually, if we back up a little bit to chapter 9. In John chapter 9, if you read it, and we're not going to read the whole chapter, uh, it's the story of the man who was born blind that he received his sight. Jesus gave him back his sight. And they ended up throwing him out of the synagogue because... Uh, It was the Sabbath day, and we can't do things like that on a Sabbath day. But anyway, in verse uh, 39 of John chapter 9, and you can read that whole chapter, Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. That kind of doesn't make any sense, does it? And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? See, the Pharisees thought they had it all together. And everybody that knew him thought they had it all together. Pharisees were, they were like the top, top rung, you know. But Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains it. Again, it seems like a little bit of a puzzle there. But see, I, I found out and I've learned, is, uh, I've been doing this now for 20 years, and you would think that, and I've said this before, you would think that the longer you do it, the, the better you would get at it and the easier it gets. But I have something to tell you. If you want to do a ministry, don't expect to get better with time. The closer you get to God, the more you're going to find out how, how, how inadequate and how unable you really are. And if you think you've ever came to a place where you've really, man, I've got it now. I've got this thing down pat. I can, I can preach a message. I can write it out in 15 minutes. and I can just stand up and and make people jump and run and do everything and preach the word. And I got it all together, but you got to better watch out. When you get to the place where you think you've got so good at what you're doing in the spiritual realm. Now, you know, it's, it's different if you're, you know, if you play golf or something that you want to get better. But you find out that the, the further you go, the more you need Christ. The further you go, the more you need Christ. So, he goes on. That was just a little introduction. Read into that. In chapter 10, it says this. Verily, verily, Jesus says, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. We've talked about this before in ancient Israel. The shepherds would take their sheep out to, to graze, and in the evening there would be an enclosure where they would bring their sheep back uh, Sometimes there would be a number of different shepherds in one particular enclosure, and they would bring their sheep back into the enclosure, and there was only one way in or one way out. That way they could guard against thieves or robbers that would come in, and also animals, wild animals that would kill the sheep. So Jesus has said there's only one way in to the sheepfold, and he says, uh, 
He that enters in not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs in some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. You see, the shepherd, the sheep and the shepherd, they developed a relationship with each other. Now, sheep aren't very bright. They're not really smart animals. But they recognize the voice of their particular shepherd. If another shepherd would come or some other voice would come and call, they wouldn't follow because they knew it wasn't their shepherd. They, they, they knew what flock they belonged to and who, who, who their shepherd was, and that's who they would follow. Now, I don't know. I, I have, we have a dog at home, okay? Uh, how many of you have a dog? Okay, okay, dog. How many people? Now, my dog is getting old, and we thought for a while that she was losing her hearing. But I'm finding out that my dog has developed selective hearing. <laughs> some, like some people, you know. If we, if we say to the dog, if Rose says to the dog, you want a cookie, she, her ears perk up. She likes that. But when it's time to take a bath, all of a sudden she can't hear, okay? I think that's the way some of us are. <laughs> we, we hear, there's some things we want to hear and some things we don't want to hear. But here's the thing. If you belong to God, you will hear his voice, and you'll recognize his voice. What you do with it is another thing. But if you hear his voice, if you belong, Jesus said, I'm the shepherd. Uh, Reading down a little bit, he says, and a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable Jesus spoke unto them, but they understood it not, but things which he spoke unto them. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father but through him. He's our good shepherd. And if you belong to him, you'll hear his voice. I can remember back when I was just on the cusp of getting saved, right on the edge. And I was hearing things that, that I knew were right, but I didn't want to admit they were right. I, I was hearing things that I knew were coming from God, but I didn't want to admit it because they were challenging me to do things in my life that I didn't want to do. Eventually, I couldn't cancel out the voice of God. And I'm not talking about audible voices again. I'm not talking about a voice in heaven saying, you know, do this or do that. But I knew in my heart that still small voice was there and it was prompting me and urging me and pulling me and convincing me and convicting me to do the things that God wanted me to do. And I was resisting until finally, thank God, and I know some of you, many of you have this testimony, until his love broke through the brick wall. His, his love tore down the barrier that I had set up. And now I know by faith that I hear his voice. It might not be an audible voice. But I know when he's leading me. And I know when he's warning me. And I know when he's directing me. I have learned to tell that. And if, if I ever get to the point where I, I miss his voice, he's always faithful and true to send something or someone my way to wake me up and remind me that, hey, I'm talking to you. Now, when we talk about the voice of God, there's so many places in the scriptures where people heard the voice of God. I just want to look at a couple this morning. Because I want to encourage you that if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to believe that you will hear God's voice. You might not hear an audible voice, but that leading, that prompting, that nudging that we get. How many people know what I'm talking about? It's there. There have been times I have neglected or I have rejected that, and I paid the price for it. I'll tell you, I've I've told this story before. One time I was in church with Pastor Spencer over at Trenton Church of God. I was sitting at the piano, okay, and God was prompting me to, to give a message in, in unknown tongue. He was, I felt it in me, and I said, I don't know if that's God or not. <laughs> Have you ever been there? Yeah. I don't know if that's the Lord or not. God, is that you? And Pastor Spencer said this. I mean, I'm sitting there, and Pastor Spencer said, God's given something to somebody, <laughs> right? 
I mean, I wasn't jerking or jumping, nothing. I was just sitting there, and I shut up. I didn't say nothing. Oh, don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. <laughs> I paid the price for that. I'm still, every once in a while, I paid the price for that one. Okay? Because I knew it was God's voice, I knew, but I was disobedient. See, we hear his voice. Don't be afraid to respond to his voice. I mean, I wasn't hearing a, a voice in my head speaking to me, but I knew. Because my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice, and I know them. A couple of places. We're just going to look this morning, do a little topical study this morning, okay? Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel. I'm going to talk about the voice of the Father, first of all. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. That's Mark. i got to go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 3. And uh, starting at verse uh, 13, start at verse 13. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need uh, to be baptized of thee, and you come to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for this it become, thus it becomes uh, for, for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice came from heaven. Now this is an audible voice. A voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The voice of God, the voice of the Father. What was he saying? L listen, when the Father speaks, he's usually glorifying Jesus. If you hear the, an audible voice f f from somewhere and it's not glorifying Jesus, reject it. If you hear a voice, in, if something prompts you in your heart and it's not glorifying to Jesus, uh, reject it. If it's not calling Jesus the Son of God, the Messiah, reject it. There's a lot of voices that say a lot of things about Jesus. Jesus asked his disciples, he says, what do, who do men uh, say that I am? They say, uh, some say you're Jeremiah, and some say Isaiah, one of the prophets, and so forth. And he said, well, who do you say that I am? Everybody has some opinion about Jesus. You've got to make sure it's the right one. If it's coming from God, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The voice of God. The same thing happened in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. Turn there. We'll start with verse 1. Matthew 17 and verse 1. It's a place called the Mount of Transfiguration. It says in chapter 17 and verse 1, And after six days Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into a mountain, a high mountain apart. Verse 2. And he was transfigured before them. Now, if you read chapter 16, that's where... Peter made the great confession that you are, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and so forth, okay. Uh, and, and he told them at the very end of that chapter, he said, uh, I say that there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So what do we see on this mount of, called the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus went up to this mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he was changed. Verse 2, he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Glory. Jesus in his glory. Shekinah glory that we read about in the Old Testament. The fire at night and a cloud by day when God appeared in his glory. Jesus is appearing in his glory. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah. Talking with two heavy hitters from the Old Testament. Standing there talking to Jesus. If you read Luke's gospel, it says they were talking to him about his decease or his exodus. They were telling him about his death in this transfiguration. It's something how glory is associated with death. Okay. Then answered Peter, good old Peter. You guys have heard me preach on this before. Peter said, hey, let's open up an amusement park. <laughs> let's, but he, says, hey, he said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. We'll build a, a couple shrines here. This is a good place. And people will come and we can charge them money to come and open a worship a big shrine. While he yet spake, 
While Peter had his, you know, had his foot in his mouth. He was always putting his foot in his mouth. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Again, the Shekinah, the cloud by, by day and the fire by night. A bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said what? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The same thing he said when he was baptized. But he added something. He said, hear ye him. The voice of God pointing to the voice of Christ. Pointing to the words of Jesus. Verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when he had lifted them up, they saw no man save Jesus only. cloud went away. But they heard the voice of God. And what did he say? This is my beloved son to whom I am well pleased. Obey him. Listen to him. Don't worry about Moses and Elijah. Listen to what Jesus has to say. One more place where we read the voice of the Father. Over in John's Gospel, chapter 12. We'll turn some pages this morning. But not too many. I usually like to stay in one place because I don't like change, turning pages, but I figured we'd do it a little different. John chapter 12. And... Uh, we want to start with verse, I'll find it. Look at verse 27. Now maybe we ought to back up. Look at verse uh, 23. This was, this was in the Passion Week. This was in the last week. Jesus answered them and said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be what? Glorified. glorified. When you hear that word glory, what do you think of? You think light, shining, power, glory. Okay. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Again, we're talking about glory in conjunction with dying. He that loves his life... He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Again, we get this. Jesus would say these things sometimes, and, and you read them, and it kind of bounces around in your brain a little bit. Does that mean I should want to die? I mean, I'm not going to go out and kill myself. What's he talking about? He's talking about the old man dying. If we're willing to sacrifice the old man, we'll receive a new life that will last forever. If we're not going to sacrifice the old man, then we're stuck with this. And we're going to die someday. And we'll spend an eternity apart from him. He says, He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Verse 26, if any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Now listen, he, he, made this, he asked this question. Glorify thy name. Then came a voice from heaven. Here we go again. God speaking, the Father speaking from heaven. Then came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. What's he talking about? He's getting ready to go to the cross. The glory that he's asking for isn't the glory of fame and power and wealth and all these things. It's the glory of dying for the sins of the world. That's, there's glory in that. Do you know if you're willing to give your life in this earth for the lives of others, if you're willing to, to sacrifice your life and allow the life of Christ to be in you, your, 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 your hope is glory. There's glory in that. It might not be immediate glory. It doesn't look good right now, but there's going to come a time when you're going to spend eternity in the presence of God. This is why it's so important, why glory is associated with dying. We need to die to ourselves that we might live unto him. And that he might live in us. And all these voices we've been reading so far, the voice of the Father says, My beloved Son, in whom I'm well, uh, well pleased. My beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Obey him. And now I'm going to glor I glorified your name before, and I'm going to glorify it again. 
the day before the cross. Okay, now, a couple other passages, all right? Look at, turn to, turn to John chapter 3. So I, I want you to get an idea of when you hear, when you think you're hearing God's voice, what it's going to sound like and what, it's, what, it's, what the intention is going to be. Because you know what? There's, there's a beautiful side to evil. You know that? There's a, a lady who wrote a book one time, Beautiful Side of Evil. I don't know if you ever read it. A lady who was involved in the occult. You know, Satan can make himself look like an angel of light. Paul warned about that. He can come speaking wonderful things that will make you feel so good. But the voice of God carries with it a different purpose. Look at John chapter 3. We want to start with verse, uh, let's start with verse uh, 25. Now we're talking about John the Baptist now, okay? There arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John the Baptist and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, meaning Christ, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and they're going to him instead of you. John. Somebody was asking, hey, you know, John was doing all this baptizing, and all of a sudden, here comes this new guy. He's not wearing a leather girdle. He's not eating locusts and honey, but they're, they're baptized more than John is. What's with it? And they were calling into question, they were calling into question who this Jesus really was. Because they knew there was something about John because he was out there. He was out in the wilderness and he was a prophet. They knew he was a prophet. But here comes this Jesus. Okay. Listen to what John says in verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Verse 29. He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is therefore fulfilled. John, he was losing his disciples, but he wasn't upset. He was rejoicing. Why? Because when you hear the voice of the bridegroom, it should bring joy. The voice of God should bring you joy. Not fear. Sometimes it brings correction. But even in that correction, there's joy in knowing that we have a relationship with a God that speaks to us. John was willing. He goes on and he says, I got to decrease that he might increase. John was willing to, to part from his office at the coming of Jesus. And we know the story. He ended up getting his head cut off. A lot of people look at that and say, well, look what happened to him. But see... There's glory in death. It goes together. That's what the voice of God says. And, and here, John says, when, I, when, when we hear the voice of the bridegroom, when the M Messiah comes, it brings great joy. It, nothing else matters. My position, my, my uh, calling, whatever it might be, compared to him, when he, he's coming, I'm going to step aside and let him do what God's called him to do. Now listen, John the Baptist was human. There was a time in his ministry where he sent his disciples to Jesus to ask him when John was in prison. And he sent his disciples to Jesus and he said, are you really him? Because John got thrown in jail. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 11. We're not going to turn there. But Jesus said, let's turn there. Can we turn there? Matthew chapter 11. I don't want to pass that. I just don't want to leave that and pass it up. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Just at the very beginning. In chapter 11 and verse 1, it says this. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in prison... John, you decrease that Jesus might increase. You, you rejoice to hearing his voice. You're you know, the bridegroom coming. You're the best man, and he's the bridegroom. And you rejoice at that. Now, John, you end up in prison for righteousness sake. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't commit a crime. He did what was right. 
Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And he said unto him, Are you he that should come, or do we look for another? Maybe I missed it. John, maybe John was thinking, maybe I, miss, I'm, I'm, maybe I missed God's voice. You know, results don't necessarily, circumstances don't necessarily indicate how, much you've, how well you've heard God's voice. Sometimes you listen to God's voice and get in trouble with the world. That's what happened with John. And he was wondering. Some people have chided John for this. I don't. If I was him, I'd probably wonder too. Now listen, Jesus answered. Here's the voice of Jesus now. Go and show John again those things that you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. The voice of God will tell you to keep your eyes fixed on him no matter what's going on around you. See, it would have to be the voice of God that would speak to our sister Carol after being robbed to still give him glory. I know there have been times in my life when bad things have happened. I started kicking the wall and saying, God, why did you let that happen to me? God had to shake me up a little bit. It's the voice of God. Okay, a few more passages. Look at uh, John chapter 18. And... uh, Starting at verse, uh, my Bible. <laughs> uh, let's let's start at verse um, thirty-three. Just read down to it. This is Jesus. This is the trial of Christ in front of Pontius Pilate. Pilate entered into the judgment hall and called Jesus and said unto him, "Are you the King of the Jews?" And Jesus said unto him. You know, do you think this yourself, or did somebody tell you this? Pilate answered and says, I'm not, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you into me, unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. The voice of God is this. The voice of Christ is this. It tests you. It's a, it's a, it's a test. Just like they, they test gold to see how pure it is. God's voice, the word of God, the word of Christ, it tests you. How well, how well do you hear and obey God's word? It's a test. God's voice will challenge you. God's, listen, God's voice will not say, it's okay. Go ahead. It's all right. Everybody's doing it. So a lot of people think they hear God's voice that way. God's voice will never tell you to do something against his law, against his word. But it will challenge you. See, that's why a lot of people like to stop their ears when God speaks to them. That's why I was stopping my ears when people were trying to witness to me and the Lord was trying to deal with me before I was saved. I didn't want to hear it because I knew I was hearing God's voice and he was telling me about things I was doing that wasn't right. Jesus says, everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. My sheep hear my voice. They know my voice and I know them. And Pilate asked the question of the century. What is truth? His word is truth. God's word is truth. His voice is truth. God can't lie. Whether the, 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 our, our culture agrees with it, whether the government agrees with it, whether your neighbors agree, whether you agree with it, His word is truth. And it will always lead you to truth. It will test you. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 9. Just a couple more. Starting at verse 1. And Saul, who later became Paul, okay, a Pharisee, 
a powerful, educated man, knew the Old Testament inside and out, studied at the feet of a great teacher named Gamaliel, Saul, Rabbi Saul. Some believe he might have been being groomed to be like the next high priest, or at least the next leader of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish leading uh, governing body. Up and coming, powerful, brilliant, well-respected Pharisee. When this bunch rose up, the claim to be followers of the Messiah, Saul said, I'll take care of them. He was there at the martyrdom of the first, uh, he was there when the first martyr was killed, Stephen. You read about that in a few chapters before this. He like assented to it. He was the one, he was sort of like the one in charge. So it says in chapter 9 and verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. I mean, he was, he was zealous. He thought that he was doing God. He, he was like at the forefront of God's army doing this. He was convinced. Because all his life, he read the Old Testament. All his life, he studied God's words. He, he did everything he could to live according to God's law. If you read in Philippians, he says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, according to the, the law of righteousness, uh, blameless. I, I did everything I should have done. I filled in all the blanks, right? I answered all the questions I was living. I made sure that I took care of everything. I made sure I tithed every little seed and every little thing. I, was, I did everything. And when this Christian bunch rose up, these, uh, they weren't called Christians then. They were followers of, of Jesus Christ. They thought they were a renegade bunch of Jews. And he just said, we've we got to round them up and do something about this bunch. And he desired of him letters. He went to the high priest, verse 2. And he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be uh, men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He had got a bunch of bench warrants in his hand. He said, give me a warrant. I'm, I'm going to go to Damascus. I'm going to round this bunch up. Dangerous. They're dangerous. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him, what? Light, glory, glory. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, I hope and pray we've all heard this voice at one time or another. It might not have been in a, in a shroud of light and glory. It might not have been a booming, loud voice. Maybe it was just something on the inside. But every one of us, at one time or another, if you're saved, now there was a time in your life when you heard that voice inside your heart that said, why are you, why are you persecuting me? He said, uh, Saul said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And the, and the, and the picture is, they would, when they would have oxen pulling a, a cart, they would have these sticks with points on them, and they would, they would poke them. Man, I, God poked me a lot. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? I thank God for His mercy and His grace, that He doesn't give up on us after the first time. Sometimes we give up after the first time. We'll go witness to somebody else, like, get away from me. Oh, I don't do that anymore. I really believe that this Saul, who later became Paul, I believe he, he was hearing God's voice way before this. It seems, from what this says, it seems this way. It says that he was, he was there when they stoned uh, Stephen. And Stephen, when he was getting ready to die, he looked up and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I wonder if Saul heard that and said, what? The voice of God will arrest you. It arrests sinners. The voice of God will confront you and arrest you. And it won't blink its eye and say, oh, it's okay, I know your heart. It'll say, why are you resisting me? Why are you resisting my word? Why, why do you refuse to be obedient? Why? And it's not saying that in a judging way or condemning way. We do that. We say, what's wrong with you? But he does it with love. 
See, he had plans for Saul. God had big plans for Saul. He's saying, Saul, how long are you going to resist me? The word of God, whether it's a, a, a voice that you hear audibly or whether it's that still small voice in your heart, it will come to you and say, why do you keep resisting me? It wants to arrest you. It wants to make you its own. Verse 6, Saul said, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? I mean, can you just imagine? Here's Saul on his face, and here's this Jesus, and Saul's out to arrest his followers. And Jesus gives him instructions. Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul got up from the earth, and he was blinded, and he had to be led into Damascus. Now listen, he went on to speak. Look at verse 10. And there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord uh, said in a vision. Now, God's, now the Lord is speaking to this Ananias in a vision. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come. He's seen you coming and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias saying, Are you, Lord, Saul? I heard about him. He got a warrant for my arrest. He wants to throw me in jail. And the Lord said, it's all right. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias was obedient, and he did what God told him to do. When you hear God's voice, it will always be something to accomplish his purpose. Now, we never hear of Ananias again in the Word, but we know what happened to Saul. He went out and started spreading Christianity all over, the, all over the known world at that time. What if Ananias would have said, I ain't doing it? Oh, God would have found somebody else, but he wouldn't have got his name in the Bible. Okay. All right. One more. One more thing. And we're going to close. Turn to Acts chapter 18. Now we see the Apostle Paul, and he's traveling through Europe. If you read the book of Acts, uh, now his name has been changed. They call him Paul now instead of Saul. And he was, he was up in the northern part of Greece, and he was Phili in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, and he was in Athens, and now he's in Corinth. If you read starting at verse 7, and he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined heart to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid. Now, if you read Paul's letter to the Corinthians, there was a place where he says, you know, when I was with you, I despaired of life. There was a time when Paul was so broken up and so afraid and, and nothing seemed to be going right for him and he just he didn't even feel like living anymore and it was in Corinth but the word of God came to him and he said be not afraid but speak and hold not your peace for I am with thee and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee for I have much people in this city listen when the word of God comes to you you know if, if you don't remember anything maybe just remember this when the word of God comes to you, he's not going to come to condemn you. He's not going to come to beat you up. He's going to come to encourage you in what you're going through. If you get your stuff stolen, if the doctor comes back with a bad report, if things, if, you know, if the job is shutting down, whatever it might be, 
God will speak to you. The word of God. We hear his voice. Satan will come and lay all kinds of guilt trips on you and point a finger and say, you should have done this and you should have done that and you shouldn't have done this. And he'll, try to, he'll try to give this big old guilt trip on you. But listen, when you hear the Lord's I'm trying to, so you understand how you can tell the difference. God's voice will encourage you. God's voice will say, don't be afraid. You're not the only person I have here. That's what he told Elijah, going back to Elijah, remember? He says, I got, you think you're the only one left? He says, I got thousands that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. He went to Paul and he said, listen, don't be afraid. Speak what I've given you to speak. Do what I've given you to do. And I want to tell you this morning, beloved, if you're followers of Jesus Christ, don't be afraid to step out. Don't be afraid to take that step. Don't be afraid to take that stand. To stand up for what you know is right. You'll be rejected. There'll be folks in the world that won't want to have anything to do with you. Come on, you get saved. Sometimes family members don't want to talk to you anymore. If they talk to you real, they're real kind of they're real careful not to bring up certain topics. Come on, how many people know what I'm talking about? You get with your family and they know you're saved and they're gonna stay away from certain topics. Oh, don't, talk, don't talk about that. Don't mention church. Don't mention time. Don't mention. Let's talk about baseball. Talk about football. The word of God will encourage you, will bring you joy. It will test you. And it will always encourage you to move on and up. It will never lay a guilt trip on you. It might convict you. There's a difference. There's a difference between being convicted and being having a guilt trip laid on you. Conviction is for the purpose of bringing you to salvation. Condemnation is for the purpose of burying you in the ground. I want to encourage you this morning. Listen for the voice of God. You know something, believers... Somebody might say, well, I'll never hear God's voice. Oh, if you're, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you'll hear his voice. You will. He speaks to us. He might not speak to us in an audible, you know, voice. It might be a still, small voice, but he'll speak to you. And in, in troubling times, like we're living in right now, he's, he's speaking to us. He's saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's scary when you hear about the economy and you hear about nuclear and you hear about sc- he said, don't be afraid. If you're his, if you're not his, then be afraid. <laughs> but if you belong to him, if you're his sheep and he's your shepherd, then you hear his voice. He knows those who are his. He knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you've been through. He knows everything about you. We don't have to be afraid of him. We don't have to be afraid of his voice. But we need to be listening. How many people are listening for God's voice this morning? Listening for God's voice. I'm so thankful I have a God. I'm so thankful that he didn't give up on me. When when he was sending people my way and he was letting things happen to me that he I knew, I knew he was, I knew there was a God. And I didn't want nothing to do with him. I'm I'm so thankful that he didn't give up on me. Are you thankful that he didn't give up on you? Amen. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that he still hasn't given up on me. Even some of the stuff I've done and things I've done since I've been saved, he could have kicked me out of the army. He could have given me a dishonorable discharge, but he didn't. He took me aside, and he started to teach me. See, there have been, there have been times I've had a lot more grace than wisdom. <laughs> you know, you can, you know, grace is a good thing, but you can have more grace than wisdom. You know that? God, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom. Amen? Stand with me as we close. My hope is built. On nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.